Today is Epiphany Sunday. Who can tell me what the word Epiphany means? Yes, sir. Mm, almost, but not. It's when the wise men came, the word Epiphany means revelation. And the Epiphany is when Christ was revealed to the Gentiles. The wise men were not Jews, the wise men were Gentiles. And when they came, it said that Christ had come, not for just one people, but for all people. And so we celebrate Epiphany in the church, and we've got a party going on today, right after worship, downstairs in our fellowship hall. We hope you came hungry, or if you will be hungry by then, because we have a lovely brunch that's been prepared for us. And then we're going to have a party. We've had the Epiphany party on Wednesday nights the last few years, but we're going to have a good time. We've got some games to play related to the Epiphany, the wise men. And someone at the party, uh, you get a cupcake, and in that cupcake, one cupcake, and a little bitty baby. Uh, and if you get that baby, then you are the king or the queen of the party. Uh, and that's a special thing. Elizabeth Moore was doing the party one year, and oh, she reigned well. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we hope you'll stay after church and, and come to the party. will be done before any of that rain comes in. We hope so. <laughs> We're talking about why it's going to come in a message which is titled, The Great Compelling. <clears throat> well, it happened in the summer of 2011, just weeks before our family moved here to Jerseyville. In the wee hours of June 3rd, a student at Indiana University named Warren Spear disappeared after a night of partying with friends in Bloomington, Indiana. An intense search for Lauren began immediately, and those who had been with her on that fateful night were questioned extensively, and leads were followed, and the news coverage of the investigation was constant. After Patty fell and broke her ankles at the Bloomfield July 4th fireworks, she was in a rehabilitation facility in Bloomington, so we were over there uh, a lot. And you couldn't go very far without seeing a poster with Lauren Spears' smiling face on it, with the word missing in bold print above her head, the offer of a reward for any information leading to her safe return. We prayed for Lauren to be found. We prayed for her parents, too, so desperate to find their daughter. And then in August, we moved here, leaving the search for Lauren Spear in full swing behind us. In the years since, I've occasionally Googled Lauren's name, and the same sad information comes up, that she is still missing after all this time. This week, her mother, Charlene Spear, posted the following on social media. Here is what she wrote, quote, Too many New Year's have come and gone since Lauren's disappearance. 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and now 2018. This time of the year is without doubt one of the most difficult. Holidays and Lauren's birthday back to back. We, Rob, Rebecca, and I all navigate the days in our own ways, but rest assured, Lauren is with us every passing moment. You learn to live with routines which get you through the weeks, months, years. We will never know normal. Some of the things taken for granted in ordinary families are so far removed from ours, it's difficult to fathom. What I wouldn't give to hear Lauren's voice, or even just to notice a text on my phone, something so simple as a text. My heart breaks the thought of it. Those responsible will never be able to imagine. There are folks we're close to who have complete faith we will know the truth someday and justice will be served. I hope that is the case. That 2018 is the year for truth and hoping today is that day. <coughs> Now, if you try and put yourselves in the shoes of Lauren Spears' family, you can only begin to imagine the great compelling that is theirs to find their daughter. Regardless of how many years have passed, 
to secure answers to their most pressing questions, to continue prodding the Bloomington Police Department to keep that investigation alive, for in it is held the hope that someday soon, no matter what happens, they will bring Lauren home. And so today, <coughs> until that day comes, every single day, the search continues. If you've ever lost anyone or anything precious to you, then maybe you've had a similar compelling, an intense desire to find that which is missing, to rescue it from danger if need be, to have it back safely by your side again. Jesus talks about a shepherd who had such a compelling. This fellow had a hundred sheep in his flock, a sizable number, lots of sheep to watch out for. But one night when he counted them, he discovered that one was missing. Now common sense might tell you that the wisest thing to do was to stay with the 99 sheep who hadn't strayed and hope that missing lamb somehow find its way home. I mean, to leave all the others vulnerable to an attack by wolf or bear or maybe thieves to go looking for the lost one was a major risk, right? But lo and behold, Jesus says that's exactly what that shepherd did. He left the 99 and went off to the hillside in a desperate search for that lone, lost sheep. Now, why does he do that? Maybe because he was accountable to the owner of the flock and would have to pay for any sheep that was lost. Could be. Or maybe, maybe he just worried about what was happening to that sheep out there in the dark. Frightened, hurt perhaps. His responsibility as much as the other's. The one bleeding for the shepherd to come and find it. And so eventually he did. And hoisted that fugitive critter up on his shoulders and, and carried it back to the camp and even threw a party to celebrate its safe return. Crazy, right? But Jesus says the same kind of partying goes on in heaven. When just one sinner, one lost soul, who's been lost, is found. Repents comes home. We search for people sometimes. And sometimes we search for things. A great compelling drives us in the quest to recover that which is lost. And then there are those times when, when something has been lost within us. And we go looking for what will help us find it. Or who will help us. In the Gospels, that who is Jesus. And in Luke's gospel, there's a woman who's in desperate need to find him. For 12 years, she's been bleeding. Every doctor in town has failed to fix her. This ailment prevented her from participating in worship or mixing among the folks in the marketplace. She was considered as unclean as a leper. So when she heard Jesus was, was passing through town, a great compelling and irresistible urging sends her forward seeking healing. But the crowd presses around Jesus. She's, she's, she's reaching for his garment. If she can only touch the hem, she knows she'll be well. The people push and shove. They have their needs too, you know. Her hand lunges forward. It's blocked and then it lunges forward again. And then contact. Faith. A burst of power flowing through her. And that which had been lost. Health, family, friends, hope, it all comes rushing back into her life again. It wasn't easy. Sometimes getting to Jesus can be very hard indeed. Obstacles arise. Challenges. And the question eventually becomes, how important is it to you to find him? This is a question that's related to the heart of our text today. From Matthew's Gospel. I got a kind of pastoral theory about the wise men. I've preached on these guys for over 30 years, if you think. And, and, I, and I'm thinking I have an idea of why they were willing to leave their homes and travel hundreds and hundreds of miles in order to be able to worship the one born king of the Jews. I think it's because, are you ready? Yes. I think it's because they were missing. 
Now, Matthew doesn't give us much background information on these fellows in our text. The first two verses are about all we get. This is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Here's what Matthew writes. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, that is wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That's about all we get as far as who these guys were and what it was all about. So who were these guys? Where did they come from? My favorite Scottish commentator, William Barclay, uh, pinpoints their home country as Persia which is now modern-day Iran. And they were, as far as we know, advisors to the king there. They weren't Jewish, like I said earlier. They were Gentiles, very religious men, who were experts in all the main religions of the world. And somehow they had access to the Jewish scriptures and were aware of the prophecies concerning a coming Messiah. They read from Isaiah that the one who the Jews were waiting for was destined for greatness. The prophet declaring, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You want to be a guy like that, wouldn't you? They were also aware that this same Savior was not just coming to rule, but to make himself a sacrifice for sin. The brokenness of people's lives. Isaiah also declaring, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are what? Healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Now, they had a lot of head knowledge, those wise men did. They were experts in theories, theologies, rites, and rituals. They were like walking encyclopedias. They were like early forms of Google. Uh, ask some questions, and more often than not, they had the answers for you. They popped right up. But what I'm thinking is, at the end of the day, with all that knowledge, at the time they make their acquaintance, they were arriving at an important conclusion about themselves. And it was this. They were missing something in their lives. Big time. And no matter how many facts and figures they stuffed in their noggins, there was within them a vast emptiness. A need for something more. Something solid. Or rather, someone. Because you see, they were also there that the Messiah the Jews were waiting for wasn't just coming for the Hebrew children. He was also coming for folks like them, the Magi. Isaiah reporting this key revelation where God told him, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. My goodness, thanks. Did that mean that the light of salvation might reach all the way to Persia? If so, what form might it take? I remember these wise men were also astrologers, right? They were stargazers. And no doubt they knew the text for the book of Numbers, a prophecy from Balaam concerning the Messiah, which said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. So, when a new star appeared in the heavens, shining over Jacob's house, these wise men, who no doubt had, had sins that needed forgiveness, and wounds that needed mending, and trials that pressed them to long for peace, just like you and me, they realized that all the prophecies are forming a definitive picture. The stars are literally lining up. And within them surges a great compelling to go. To 
to see this newborn king, to finally give themselves over to a higher power by bending low. Now, I suspect when they announced their plan was to set out on a journey that could take them away for two years, they might have gotten some flack from loved ones near and dear. Like the shepherd who left the 99 sheep to look for the one, this trip the wise one want to take uh, sounded kind of illogical, didn't it? Impractical to their wives, their children, their employers. How could they just pick up and take off? Were they crazy? No. But for the first time in a long time, I think they were hope. Eager to be filled with something other than what their intellectual pursuits could give them. This is a matter of heart and soul. So regardless of what forces may have risen against them, the pressing question became, how important is it for us to find them? Their answer? It was very important. So they go for it. With the same great compelling that led that woman to push the crowd, touch the hem of Jesus' garment. The search was on to secure that which was missing, which held the promise of making their lives whole. And the text from Matthew tells the rest of their story. That after meeting with King Herod, who wanted to find Jesus for different reasons, the Magi find themselves headed in the right direction. Look what Matthew says in Matthew 2, beginning at verse number 9. It says, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now keep in mind, we're not at the stable in the manger, right? This is like two years later. She was a little guy. He's toddling around. They're around the house someplace. When they saw the star, they were what? Overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and what? Worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures, the ones we sang about in the, in the, in the carol, and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, why are they overjoyed? I don't think it's just because they're ready for a long rest after that long time on the road. I think it's because their quest has been honored like an answered prayer. They find themselves in the presence of the Christ, the one Isaiah had told them all about. The child is born, the son is given, and they're compelled to fall on their knees before him in worship. There is gift giver giving, honoring this small child, recognizing his royal lineage, his, his priestly connections, the great sacrifice he would make. And then just like that, off they go. Because here's the deal. If it took them two years to get to Bethlehem, how long do you suppose it's going to take them to get home? Two years. Oh my gosh. Even with the new crowd, even with the GPS recalculated. It's going to be about two years. But they don't go home the way they came, right? That's what the text said. They changed routes. But I'm thinking they were also changed men. Having beheld their Messiah, they would never be the same. And the same should be true for us, right? For anyone who has encountered the Christ and asked him to be Lord and Savior of their lives. And, and, and a lot of folks in this room here have done just that at one time or another, given our hearts to Jesus. And when we first did so, there was excitement, right? I was overjoyed like the wise men when I came to know Jesus. Weren't you? But then a strange thing happens. Want to hear about it? We commit to following Jesus, and we end up doing church the way it's traditionally done, the way most of us have been doing it for a long, long time. We come to believe that being a Christian is a lot about finding the right programs to do in the church, or it's about serving on committees, or, or, or rewriting constitutions, or wrangling over carpet colors, or spending money, or who's on first? Cash my grip. <laughs> Salvation by works. I mean, you know I love the church, don't you? Yes. And I've given my whole professional life in service to it. But God, God, do you ever start to wonder if this father is? Jesus called us to be disciples so we could make disciples. 
His call to the church was to go into all the world, and what does the church tend to do? We usually stay inside, especially in cold weather, right? We hunker down, and we wait for the world to come and find us. And when they do, they better not sit out you. <laughs> Welcome. We're so glad you're here. I sit over here. Uh, I've been reading books on vacation. At <laughs> now, <laughs> now, what's the end result of all this? I think it is the state of the Church of Jesus Christ in the year 2018. We have reaped what we have sown. We have filled our, ourselves with head knowledge. We've mastered some Bible passages and Robert's Rules of Order. We've written annual reports about how busy we are doing church, and the world that God called us to doesn't want to read them. That's pretty much washed their hands of us. Why? Because what they need, the grace and the mercy and the love of God, often seems to be in short supply in the church. We're so busy doing other things, right? Take care of in-house stuff instead of out-house stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't outside, the outside the house, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't stray from my name. <laughs> and you start to wonder, are you wondering? Is there any hope that things get better? And the answer is, somebody say yes? yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course there is. Because this cycle we're in, this drift from our original purpose, this wandering away from our first love, which has been going on for years, that's the history of the church. From Israel to modern-day Jerseyville. We get overjoyed, then we get cocky and overconfident, proud, then we get sloppy, and then we find ourselves living with something I call holy discontent. That is, a sense that things aren't the way they should be, or they could be. You ever felt that way? Maybe you feel that way this morning, I suppose. If so, that's a good thing. Because holy discontent comes from God. I think it's what the wise men had. No matter how much they fed their minds, they found themselves starving to death in their spirits. They got sick of doing business as usual. They had to find a new way to live, to breathe. And that meant the search for Jesus, even if he was two years away. The great compelling to know the one who is the way and the truth and the life. So what's this message about? Can you figure it out? It's about the fact that we want this year to be different than last year. And the year before, which one is it? It's about the need for a renewed connection to Jesus Christ in our personal journeys and our collective journey as a church. It's about grace and forgiveness and opening ourselves up to God for a new thing to happen at First Baptist. But to have it, guess what? We've got to want it. Want it more than we want our own way. Want it more than the way things were done back in the day. Want it enough to invest, to commit, to stop giving lip service to God about our good intentions and actually step up to the plate and be counted. As opposed to, I'm so busy, I'll get there when I can. God knows my heart. God knows my heart! Maybe he does. Maybe that's not good. If you want life at First Baptist to be healthier and more vital in 2018, don't look to somebody else to make that happen. Pastors can't do it. Deacons can't do it. And even trustees can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. Amen. So look to Jesus and ask him what he wants you to do and you to be in order for his will, for his church to be accomplished. And then... Pray. Pray like you've never prayed before that a holy discontent, a great compelling will come unto you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. A compelling that holds a potential for transformation. Do you want that to happen in your life? Do you? Yes. Now be honest. If you don't, it's okay. Well, it's not okay, but it's good to be honest. <laughs> Do you think it can happen in the church? I believe it can. And I know a lot of you believe that too. So let's put our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, who is the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith. Even as we ask ourselves that most important question, how important is it to me? How important is it to this church to find Jesus? Amen.
of the, the wise men was very important. It was a great compelling. I want to share with you the song of the wise men. Uh, it's called We Will Find Him. And the excitement they have, I pray, is the excitement we have as we enter into this new year again. We will find him. You might have to turn up, guys. It's an old, old cassette. <laughs> They have to manually move it. Yeah. There we go. Find us. 
is represented on this table in the bread and the cup. The great compelling he had to help deliver us from darkness and bring us out into light is represented by a broken body and shed blood. This table is prepared for us to celebrate. And you want to think about the meaning of this. Not just for the church, but for each one of us individually. What it says, if you've been the only person on earth, this meal would have been amazing. We're going to sing a hymn that talks about this. One day, hymn number 196, first, second, and fourth stanzas. If you have a decision to make regarding your walk with Jesus Christ today or with this church, we invite you to come. If you have a, have a need for prayer today, as you're starting this new year, maybe you're in some trouble right now, or need of healing, or, or just need of someone to walk beside you in a, in a challenging season, we'll have deacons here to pray with you. I'll be here as well. 